Well, welcome everybody to um, this OpenShift Commons Image Builder SIG uh, meeting. We're going to have a talk today from um, Mark Borshton and Brian Bullock of Tremolo Security. And you've heard them before talk about Open Unison and identity management on uh, an OpenShift Commons briefing in the past. And I've invited them back here again because they've done um, taken the next step and they've containerized Unison and Open Unison. Um, by that we mean we put it in a Docker container and use the tool chain, which is source to image, that um, is part of the OpenShift project, to build that. And I thought it would be a great thing to have them talk about the lessons they learned, what they had to do creating um, and containerizing with that process, but also you giving the sort of service providers. They have an identity management service, which they're going to explain what um, that all does too in this talk today. Um, because I know there's a lot of interest in other service providers and people with packages that they want to package up and make sure work, not just in OpenShift, but anywhere. Um, so I thought this would be a really good way to start the conversation, have a good working example. We had one a couple weeks ago. Um, Crunchy Data did one talking about packaging up um, and containerizing Postgres. But we're continuing to see and learn more about you know, the different aspects of packaging up your service. So without too much further ado, Mark's going to um, introduce himself and his partner here. And we'll kick it off and then ask any questions in the chat. Um, and at the end of maybe 20, 30 minutes of talking um, and demoing how this all works, we'll open it up for a conversation um, as part of the state. So take it away, Mark. So, uh, Diane, thanks for the opportunity to, to present again. Uh, my name is Mark Borstein. I'm the CTO of Tremolo Security. Um, and uh, my partner in crime here is Brian. Hello? Yep, you're there. Um, so, like Diane said, we're going to talk about uh, how we containerized uh, our open source identity management product, uh, as well as our commercial product. And then we're going to kind of show off how that all works. Uh, with the demo of our identity management capabilities for OpenShift. So really quickly, what is Unison and Open Unison? So Unison is our commercial product. Open Unison is our open source project. Only real difference between them is that Unison has a management interface uh, and uh, what we call virtual appliance, uh, whether it's running on a container, VM, or physical hardware, uh, whereas Open Unison is a J2E application. Uh, and you have to configure everything by hand. So we're going to be focusing mostly on Open Unison from a, a demo standpoint today. So we're an identity management solution. Uh, so that means user provisioning. Uh, you know, what a, what do your applications need access to? Uh, Self service. Can users just log in and request that access rather than having to have an email chain? Uh, virtual directory for integration, SSO, and web access management. And you know, we're built on Java. And, uh, you know, really the key difference uh, from a Docker standpoint that we ran into when containerizing these systems was how they run. Because Unison is a standalone server. Uh, it's built on top of Undertow. So we have multiple Undertow instances that all run in one JVM, whether you're connecting to the identity provider or reverse proxy for web access management, the LDAP virtual directory, or the admin interface. Those all run on different ports on different Undertow instances all in one uh, JVM, whereas Open Unison, J2EE web application. So um, we had to take different approaches, and we're going to talk about both approaches. Uh, when, for the commercial Unison, um, we had to make some changes to the way, to the assumptions we made. Whereas with uh, Open Unison, we were able to use source to image, which actually made the process very very easy. So real quick before we dive into the specifics of how we built our source to image, um, we're actually going to kick off a source to image build because we're going to be downloading all the libraries. It takes a couple of minutes. Um, so I don't want to have some you know, dead air time while that process is going. So before Brian kind of talks about what our source to image build process looked like, just wanted to show you this is a GitHub repository that we're using for our demo. Uh, and this GitHub repository has our source code. So we have Scale.js, which is the interface that you'll see. 
as well as our configuration files. And there's really two config files, the myvd.conf file, which is specifically for the LDAP virtual directory that's embedded into Open Unison. And, you know, not going to dive into too many details, but what I do want to point out is that we've parameterized everything. So this one uh, source repository can be used to build dev, test, pre-prod, prod, um, all based on uh, configuration parameters. So things are, are in source control, but not secrets and passwords. Uh, and then just to show you, this is the Unison config file. Again, I'm not going to get into too many of the details as to how it's configured, um, but pointing out that we have parameterized that as well. So that's that's up on GitHub. And so what we're actually going to do is, before we talk too much about the process of building our source to image, I'm just going to kick it off. So we've got S2I build. Uh, I'm running this from our uh, source to image repository, uh, also on Docker Hub, or um, excuse, excuse me, on GitHub. Uh, and we're just gonna pass in that Git repo. This is an image that we have hosted, that's our builder image on Docker Hub, and Brian's gonna talk about that in a second. And this is the resulting image that will be created and deployed into my local registry. And one thing I wanna point out here is that this is all running against the local Docker machine. So you can use source to image to be able to create images that will run on any Docker container, uh, not just OpenShift. I go ahead, hit enter, downloaded, building, and at this point, Maven is taking over. It's gonna be running for a couple of minutes. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Brian. Thanks, Mark. So as Mark pointed out, Open Unison and Unison in general are just simple J2EE applications. Uh, they're deployed as a simple water file. So all we really need in our image is uh, a servlet container. Uh, we are relying on Tomcat for that. Uh, of course, Tomcat requires Java 8, uh, which is also in our, in our, uh, our builder image. We decided to go with CentOS and build Tomcat into the builder image um, rather than use the official Tomcat image that's available on Docker Hub uh, for a few reasons. Um, one of them being that um, we wanted to stay within the Red Hat ecosystem, perhaps the most important reason being we wanted to stay within the Red Hat ecosystem. Um, additionally, we wanted to be able to configure that for TLS, which admittedly, we could have done using the using the official Tomcat 7 image on Docker Hub, um, but again, staying within the Red Hat uh, staying within the Red Hat ecosystem, uh, a lot of stability to do that manually, anyways. Um, so our image contains very simply Java. It contains Tomcat 8, um, and it contains Maven. Our builder image allows users to to pass in either that constructed WAR file, that Open Unison constructed WAR file or a, a GitHub repo, uh, which is what Mark actually has done um, uh, and what, when he kicked off the command moments ago. Uh, passing in the WAR file um, makes things a little bit faster. Um, the builder image doesn't have to go out and download all of the, all of the uh, required libraries, doesn't have to assemble the, assemble the WAR file, um, but it also requires that the WAR file be assembled uh, and ready to be passed into the, into the builder image, which uh, isn't always going to be the case. Now, that's something that Mark and I actually talked about uh, at, at length a bit when we were putting this together and something that we actually reached out to the OpenShift Commons uh, groups to discuss uh, when we were putting this together. Do we, do we re require that the WAR file be built and pass it, into the, pass it into our builder image or do we allow a Git repo to be passed in and then have the builder image assemble that? Uh, the community was, was, was very responsive, very quick and very helpful. Uh, what they their biggest suggestion to us was to take a look at the Wildfly project. Uh, and Wildfly, the way that they, they assembled their project was to say, if you pass in a WAR file, great. We'll take the WAR file, we'll deploy that out to the server container for you. If you pass in uh, you, you know, your Git repo, great. We'll package that up using Maven for you. So we followed that same model. Um, and like I said, Mark has passed in our, our Git repo into the builder image. So that is uh, gonna take a couple of minutes, two or three minutes to go ahead and build, download all the required libraries and build that out. Um, real quick before we move on to the next slide, just wanna point out, you know, we've been talking about source to image and wanna make sure that we define what source to image is. We have a, a, a 
bullet here at the bottom with a link to source to image. Um, the way that we saw source to image is it allowed us to provide that base image and a build process without having to create our own um, scripting base, our own um, install process. Uh, it gives us a standard where we can now say, hey, you know, we, we've got the baseline image up in Docker Hub, and Brian's going to talk about that in a second. Um, but actually going from a couple of text files of configuration to a running open unison instance just requires that one command. Uh, and that, that was immensely powerful for us. Yeah, it's great to point out. Thanks for that, Mark. That was incredibly powerful for us, as Mark, as, as Mark said. Using containerization, it does uh, obviously simplify life uh, a great deal, but using source to image to go directly from that Git repo into a running configured open unison image is, is, is incredibly powerful. Uh, so what we've got laid out here is um, sort of a simple map of, of, of how all of this works for us. Our starting here, I guess, in the upper right hand side of this, this image, our, our builder image uh, is maintained on, on Docker Hub. Uh, it is built from the official CentOS 7 image that's available on Docker Hub. So anytime that CentOS 7 image is updated, our builder image is automatically updated by, by Docker Hub. Um, our Docker file is contained in a, uh, a GitHub repository. So anytime we make any changes to that, to that builder image, um, although infrequent, it may, it may happen, uh, Docker Hub will recreate that 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 image for us uh, so that's all automatically updated on on docker hub um, over on the left side here what we've got is is uh, we've got the maven central repository as well as our tremolo security repository there uh, the thing that we wanted to point out here is is our libraries are not uh, available in Maven Central. We've got our own repository where you will find and download any necessary libraries. Uh, for for our project, uh, the reason for that is we wanted to 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 provide sort of uh, uh, ownership or some 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 level of accountability, right? The 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 files, the libraries that are coming from Tremolo Security can be trusted. You know that they are coming from Tremolo Security. They are signed by our EV certificates. They're not just uh, just available up there in in, in Maven Central. And just to add to that, if if you go to Maven Central and you find Unison libraries, they're not from us, we didn't build them. And of course, nothing about our images here are, are, are specific to, 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 to Docker or, or, or really any other containerization platform. Of course, our builder images is available on Docker Hub. It is a, it is a Docker container, but all of our, all of our images are, are built sort of primarily to be run uh, in OpenShift. Anything else you wanted to add to this uh, this slide, Mark? Uh, no. Um, you know, like uh, we said before, uh, the output image can run in a Docker instance. So the demo that you're going to see here is actually running on a local Docker machine on my Mac. Great. Um, so before we go into, uh, oops, Failed to copy artifact. Okay, it looks like somebody decided to uh, make a change to one of their repositories. So we're going to go ahead and just kick off Open Unison anyway. This is the um, beauty of doing live demos, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Someone decided to make a uh, change, so um, we'll we'll take a look and see. Uh, it looks like uh, somebody changed out the um, uh, one of our uh, uh, applications that we integrate with Alfresco. Uh, so we'll take a look at that later. But I'm kicking off Open Unison now in the background. It takes a couple of minutes to start up. Um, so uh, go ahead and continue the presentation while that's going. So uh, we talked about the, the open source um, image that we created around S2I. Now we're going to talk about kind of some of the issues we ran into in creating the commercial version of Unison inside of a Docker image. Uh, we didn't go with S2I for this particular route. Um, 
mainly because S2I is really great at creating a static image based on configuration files, whereas Unison, we really wanted to balance um, the the ability to deploy inside of an image but not lose the, the power of the admin interface. Uh, and so we wanted to, instead of maybe breaking things up into microservices, which would probably be the more orthodox approach for a new app, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were keeping it as simple to deploy in Docker as it is on uh, bare metal or a VM. You know, on if, if we're starting this up from RHEL, uh, you know, yum, install Unison, the system's up and running. We didn't want to have to deploy a set of containers just to get to that same point. Um, and so as we started looking at containers, you know, the first thing we did was we broke the first rule of creating Docker images. Um, really bad fight club joke, but, you know, don't treat containers like VMs. Uh, that's the first thing we did. We said, well, we, we're, we're very lightweight. We run in a VM, great. This is going to be easy. Not quite. Um, so we ran into a lot of challenges with, with that first methodology of, well, let's just treat it like a, a VM. Uh, and, you know, not to iterate through the list, networking was a big issue. Configuration management was a big issue in security, uh, as well as how do we maintain that simplicity? You know, it's, it's super simple for us to deploy on a, a Linux VM, it shouldn't be harder to deploy on Docker. So this is kind of a typical highly available deployment for Unison uh, pre-Docker. Uh, we use a master-slave model where our configuration is all text-based, it's all XML and configuration file. And so we use a push model where a master knows about all of the different slaves and you want to make a, a configuration update, you make all your changes to the master, you're happy with it, you hit a button and it pushes out to each individual slave. Well, that doesn't really work with Docker uh, because in a dynamic environment like Docker, I, I don't know where the IP addresses are. Um, I don't want to know where the IP addresses are because you might be spinning things up, bringing things down. Uh, and so we needed a, a more dynamic approach. So we added the option of basing everything off of volumes. So we said, all right, well, we're all only reading data off of a, a drive. So let's just make the, um, the push mechanism from there as well. So we say, all right, when you spin up your Docker containers, uh, whether they're pods in OpenShift or Kubernetes or you know, some other mechanism, uh, you go ahead and spin it up and everything's off of a shared volume server. Don't care if it's, you know, SIFs, if it's uh, NFS, whatnot. Um, and so instead of having a network call to each slave, we put a marker on the file system that the slaves are looking for. It says, hey, time to reload your, your configuration. So we, we're getting the best of both worlds there. We had some other lessons learned, you know, really around security and, and that volume management. Um, from a security standpoint, uh, great, um, Resources were both the OpenShift uh, documentation as well as the Atomic, the Red Hat Atomic documentation guidelines for how to build images. Uh, that really helped us, you know, really narrow down what was going on. Uh, when we look at Docker Hub, unfortunately, most of those images run as root, which we really want to avoid. Uh, and so having that baseline really helped out. Um, and then also making sure that uh, we're staying consistent. We're not trying to fire off too many processes. You know, we've we've got it down to it's just one Java process now, which is which makes the management much easier. Um, and then from a persistent volume standpoint, uh, the way Unison was originally built, configuration information was spread across five or six different uh, directories depending on what you were configuring, and so. Our initial run, we said, okay, you, you deploy on OpenShift. Here's the mapping for each of those volumes, and you needed five or six different uh, volumes. Well, because in OpenShift, you can't guarantee the mapping from persistent volume to a persistent volume claim. Um, that caused us a lot of heartburn with, uh, with folks that were trying to use the system. So uh, we said, okay, we're going to change that so that if you're running on Docker, we're going to put all the configuration in one directory. So that way for Unison, you only have one volume point. Uh, and we're actually going to expand on that in uh, future Rev, where uh, we've got a package format that you can download all of the configuration into one file. Um, 
and use that to bootstrap a new instance. So we're trying to figure out how we want to maybe integrate that, where you just pass in a URL of the uh, bootstrapped of the the package, um, and we don't even need a shared volume. So that's a another way to get around that. Um, so we want to show off what what we're doing with Unison and Open Unison, and uh, how we integrate with OpenShift. And so what we're showing here is an environment where we're going to create a project. We're going to add annotations to the project that specify who owns the project, who's able to log in, and who owns the approval process for that project. Put a user log in for using their uh, centralized credentials out of Active Directory, request access, get approved, and log in and be able to, to work on that project. Um, this is actually piggybacked off of the demo we did at uh, Red Hat Summit a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we have a mix of both open unison and unison all running on containers um, the environment itself we have openshift running on openstack both of which are running on rel as well as red hat idm uh, those are all being managed by unison and open unison from an identity management standpoint um, obviously we're going to stick with openshift here openstack and rel uh, you know maybe another episode um, and so from an identity management standpoint, we've got two Active Directory for us because, you know, Microsoft has basically told everybody since 2000 to logically break up your Active Directory for us. So we've got two forests uh, for different sets of users. And then we have a Red Hat identity management server. Active Directory stores all of our people, our humans, our users. And uh, Red Hat identity management stores Linux-specific attributes, uh, you know, shell, SSH keys, things like that. Um, all authorizations, so all of your groups, as well as service accounts. OpenShift has kind of an interesting model for identity management where it's, it really outsources most of it. Um, and there's really kind of two ways you can add users to, authorize users to use projects. The first is to manually use the OADM command to add users to roles inside of a project. Uh, that can get messy, that can be really hard to scale, and it's almost unmanageable once you get to a certain level. Uh, the other option is to use uh, LDAP directory. So you set up a directory, you set up a group, and OpenShift provides a um, synchronization uh, capability. Uh, and that, that works pretty well. Uh, you know, the, the impediment there is that you have to manually set up these synchronization jobs. They're not real time, you know, they're periodic. Um, and so you want your OpenShift deployment to be as dynamic from a security standpoint as it is from a, a DevOps standpoint. And so we actually integrate directly with the OpenShift API so that when you get provisioned into a group, we're not adding you to a group in the directory, we're adding you directly to the group inside of OpenShift. So everything's very dynamic. You define one workflow or set of workflows for your projects and say, look, this is how uh, the approval process works. Maybe it's a single step, maybe it's a multi-step, uh, and then we handle the rest. So a project gets created, you don't have to worry about creating new workflows. So that being said, let's uh, let's get to the really fun part. So Open Unison is up and running. Like I said, it's just a uh, J2E application running on Tomcat. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and log in. I'm logging in with my uh, domain number two account with the uh, aptly name underscore two. I'm going to put in my password. So this is Scale, it's uh, Scale.js, it's an AngularJS application, RESTful APIs. So if you want to integrate this into your own portal, your own application, uh, we fully document all the APIs, nothing's hidden, nothing's secret. If I click on my profile, um, this is coming directly out of the directory in OpenShift. Uh, so you can see I already have access to three applications. And when I come into OpenShift, just to show you there's nothing up my sleeve, log in as the same user. And this is authenticating through the Unison instance running on Docker, um, virtualizing Active Directory. So you can see I've got those three projects lining up with those three groups. 
So the first thing we need to do is show you how we actually request access. So I've got this OpenShift organization set up and I've got a dynamic workflow built. And what that dynamic workflow actually does, is it talks to OpenShift to figure out what projects are available. So when I click on this and this loads up, this is actually coming directly out of OpenShift. This is not a static configuration. So you see I've got test project, test project two, and test project three. We're going to add team project four. So here's my YAML and for my new project. I'm going to make a couple of tweaks to this to make sure that it will load. So this is pretty standard. These annotations and an and annotation in OpenShift is specifically designed for use cases like this, where an external tool that wasn't built by the OpenShift team is going to work with the OpenShift um, API. So it lets us add additional data, which is great because uh, that makes our product work really well. Um, and so these, these are kind of your standard annotations that would get created if you created it through the GUI. And then we created these two additional annotations. And what these annotations say is this first one is identifying a group inside of Red Hat Identity Management that stores the list of approvers. Uh, it doesn't have to be a group. It could be a um, dynamic rule. It could be a set of users. I tend to like groups just because it makes it a little easier to uh, manage the access. The second annotation defines what group in OpenShift will allow access to this project. And so what we're gonna do is once we create this project, the next thing we're gonna do is create this group, Team App 4, and then add it as an administrator to the project. Um, we can't let you add users directly to projects. Uh, the way that Open Unison figures that out is we need to call uh, OpenShift and have OpenShift tell us what you already have access to. That mechanism doesn't exist right now, so instead of trying to do that manually, we decided to stick with groups. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this project. Save the file. So I just created the project, and now I'm gonna go ahead and create the OpenShift team app for, so that lines up with this authorization I created. Um, and then finally, I'm going to add the team app for group as an administrator role to team project for, which is the project I just created. So that's getting created. And so I'm here in request access. So you can see team project two, team project three, team project. I click on this again. I haven't made any changes to open unison. And you can now see here's team project four. So that was dynamically generated based on a dynamic workflow. So now I'm a user, I need to be able to access this project. I'm gonna check out uh, for my job. And I'm gonna submit the request. So now the request has been submitted and email has been sent to the approver. Uh, my boss is giving me a hard time, wants to know why I haven't started work yet. Well, I, I don't have access yet. Okay, so here's an example of a report that we can do of uh, my open requests. So the currently logged in user, I'm requesting access to team project four. I gotta go bug this other Matt Mosley in the other domain. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So the other Matt Mosley is gonna log in. Now I'm logging in with a different domain. So I'm logging in as the approver map, Bosley. So I'm now logged in and you can see that I have this open approval. And this is all generic bootstrap, so uh, works great on mobile devices. So this is who it's for, this is what I'm asking for, some other details. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, um, looks good. So I'm now on record as saying that the other Matt Mosley should be able to have administrative access to team project four. So other Matt Mosley has gotten that request. Now here's a really important benefit here is that now we have uh, logs. 
So I can look at the completed approvals for today, and we can see Team Project 4 that the request was made and was approved by Matt Mosley. So you could assign um, just your auditors or just your security folks access to these reports so they can't go approving anything, but they can they can get into this data and stop bugging you about it. So just show you, there is absolutely nothing up my sleeve except a notification. And I'm gonna log in now as user Matt Mosley. And when I click here, now, it's pulling up that I'm a member of the Team App 4 group out of OpenShift. So if I start, you know, if I'm having a problem logging in, I start saying, hey, I have access. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for users to forget to go to the checkout and submit things. Um, you know, for, for uh, support, it's real easy to say, well, well, does it list it as a role? No, okay, well, you didn't actually ask for it. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to log back in. So this is my current access. Uh, if I hit refresh, will it come up? Yep. And there we go. Team Project 4. I'm an admin, and I'm able to uh, start, uh, you know, my, doing my job. So we actually just showed a complete life cycle here of having the user law, uh, or having an admin create a project. That workflow gets dynamically applied to that project. So if you wanted to change uh, who the approvers are, et cetera, you make the changes directly to your OpenShift project. Um, and this can be dynamic. So we're using two attributes here, but you know you can put anything in those annotations and include it in the workflow. So you wanna add extra descriptive information, additional approval steps, that can all be driven straight from uh, the project YAML file. And then once that YAML file was created, a user was able to log in, request that access, get it approved, it was all audited, reported, and now you can see I'm logging into uh, uh, OpenShift. Um, so that kind of brings us full circle. We're using S2I, generic Docker, uh, integrating with OpenShift, and running on, um, uh, uh, running on uh, uh, OpenShift as well. So, th and that's, uh, that's the whole demo. Well, that's pretty awesome and nothing crashed there. What was the issue that you were having earlier with um, doing the STI build that you mentioned? Um, the build itself was fine, and I can actually pull it up here. It looked like there was a dependency that didn't want to get pulled down. Um, yeah, so for some reason, the active MQ dependency. Oh, no actually. Space. Uh, no space. I... Uh, Ran out of disk space. That's not good. Um, I think I need to go ahead and take a look at that. Um, but uh, huh, interesting. Um, not really sure why I did that. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was a local problem. Had nothing to do with either S2I. We we I think ran that build process like five times today and no problem. So um, once I fix my laptop, I'm sure it'll work great. All right. Why don't you throw your slides back up again so that we have uh, a background. If there's any questions um, from any of the participants at this point, just type them in the chat or raise your hand and I will unmute you. But I think it's actually an interesting um, talk that you've given because it's, it's like the open source side and when you're pulling from GitHub the build and using the base builder image, um, the whole S2I workflow works very nicely, but as you get more complicated and you want to do more things with your service, um, they look to be like an alternative. I'm wondering if you're thinking um, that, that there's anything we could do for S2I to make it work for um, the commercial offering a little better. Um, I, you know, for, for your commercial, not S2I is an open source project, I should say. Right. Um, I don't know that S2I's value would really hit, at least for us on the commercial side, um, because the, the gap between the commercial and the S2I is really the ability to have that, um, uh, the management UI. Mm -hmm. um, and because Source2i is really great at going from some text files in a 
um, Git repository to a running solution in a couple of seconds. Whereas for us, um, the management UI is where you would go ahead and at least start that process. You might be importing things, you might be executing against it, mm -hmm. um, but I, I just don't know that S2I would really have helped it for us. Yeah. Um, you know, what we have thought about doing, because, and we've had a couple of folks ask this, is, you know, maybe have a um, uh, um, hybrid approach where they love the idea of using the UI to build the config, but they actually want to use open unison in production because they don't want to make changes on the fly. They want to be able to, to say this is static. So I, and because the configurations are 100% um, compatible, uh, you take a configuration from open unison, you can drop it into unison, vice versa. You take a configuration from unison, you can drop it into open unison. Um, there's only one or two very, very specific instances where that isn't 100% the case, and that's only because those components are not components I own, and so I can't open source. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, we make those binaries available. So, um, you know, we've talked we, we've talked to folks about saying, okay, well, we'll use the management UI to generate a Git repository for you that you could then use the source to image as part of your deployment process. Um, so, and especially when you start getting into OpenShift, um, that makes it even easier because then we can integrate with builders and, and simplify through that process. So, um, from for our commercial side, I could definitely see a hybrid approach, uh, and and source image really helps us out with that. Perfect. Hmm. Brian, is there anything you wanted to add at the end of that? No, I don't think so. I think Mark does a pretty good job of summing all of that up. There was a couple of things I was going to chime in with, but uh, it's almost it's as though you were sort of reading my mind with that, Mark, with uh, some of that hybrid approach stuff. So, well done. Perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any questions in the in the chat right now, so I, you've done a really awesome job, Mark, answering most of the questions there. Um, and if you wanted to ask more questions afterwards, you can always post them on the mailing list, the OpenShift Commons mailing list, or get a hold of uh, Mark and Brian through Tremolo Security on Twitter and um, through, via email. So um, we'll pop that up. We'll be um, editing out that little tiny glitch in the beginning uh, with the, the audio and posting this as a, a web uh, uh, blog post on openshift.com and putting it on our YouTube channel shortly. So you can rewatch it and, and see if you have any questions or if there's other bits that you'd like added. Um, and I just really want to thank you for doing this because it's really one of the things that we really like to see is the different use cases for um, containerizing applications and how they're configured against and run on OpenShift. And it's done a really nice job of doing that. The, the one other one we did previously was Crunchy Data and they had a slightly different approach because they did containerize each of the, each of the um, tool pieces of tool chain. So they put Prometheus in one, the logging in other, the, the Postgres databases and others. So they did a different, a slightly different approach. And I'm not saying that any of them are better or worse. They're just um, for different applications and different processes and services, you need um, slightly different things. And so this is really good to expose this use case. So thank you very much for coming and doing this and um, everybody for joining us. And we were a little silent today. Um, and we'll be on in two weeks time with another image builder, SIG, and tomorrow, there will be an image, uh, there'll be an OpenShift Commons briefing on um, an introduction to big data um, by members of the Apache Spark team here at Red Hat. So um, we're looking forward to that. So thanks again, and um, we'll just, we'll talk to you all again probably tomorrow or um, in the following weeks to come. And if there's other folks who'd like to share their use cases for containerizing and building images, um, please let me know and we'll give you the podium next time. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you.